Yeah. yeah. They are putting your presentation there. Okay. Here's the mic. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be uh, rigid on the time because I was told I had to do that. <laughs> so, okay, I see what it is. All right. Uh, so, uh, we had discussed this topic a while back, and these are some ideas around how to create uh, a strong VC infrastructure uh, in a region. It's, it's something that we've been doing at uh, Silicon Valley for quite a number of years now. Uh, it wasn't always that way. Uh, 25 or 30 years ago, there was a very weak VC community there. But it's been getting, you know, as you well know, stronger and stronger as we go through this. So um, just very briefly on my background, um, I've invested in, as a VC, uh, certainly over 30 companies. Um, as a co-founder and an operating guy, I've started nine companies myself, uh, and I'm currently in the middle of one of those right now. Uh, so we don't believe in stopping, we just keep, keep doing it. Um, so I've been pretty instrumental in starting the uh, entrepreneurship training process at Stanford Engineering School for about the last 25 years. And as we made a point earlier today, uh, it's a process, it goes on for a long time, and you can't expect to have everything you want in a year or two. It took us, uh, as I said, a very long time. And uh, we started that process really in earnest in the late 80s. Uh, and one of those courses last fall just had its 25th anniversary. And I think it's created over 400 companies at this point. We've completely lost track of it. So a few things we're going to talk about today. Uh, the formation of tech companies and strong ones turns out to be, as you already know, a very strong driver of, of uh, gross domestic product and economic development, okay? And there are some key interrelationships that really make this kind of thing work. And uh, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, the roles of entrepreneurs and universities in conjunction is, is really, really significantly significant to this process and making it work properly. And I'm going to show you a slide in a minute, uh, which I call the silos of innovation, uh, which show you where venture capital fits in the innovation process. And it's not just about venture capital, it's about a bunch of other things too, okay? And uh, the issues we'll talk about relate to education, regulatory reform, and, and just an awareness of what kind of culture you have to have to make this kind of thing really thrive. So in the Silicon Valley, we're very fortunate. Uh, we started out with a lot of strong universities, Stanford, UC Berkeley, uh, you know, that's kind of the guys up north from us, uh, and a collection of government labs including Lawrence Livermore, Lawrence Berkeley, SRI, and some local government-backed companies that have very powerful research organizations. And what that does in a region, if you're talking about technology innovation, is it creates a huge volume of intellectual property. Uh, both just in the way uh, people are trained not necessarily licensed intellectual property, but they just have it in their head, okay? Because many companies were started in the Valley without licensing any intellectual property at all, okay? Uh, Yahoo is a good example of that, where Google started out with licensed intellectual property, no matter, okay? Now, one of the big problems in getting a hold of the intellectual property in most places in the world, including most places in the United States, actually getting the IP through a license is really, really hard. And this is a bad idea. It should be easy, but it's not. Now, at Stanford, it's really easy, okay? We can talk about that more later if we have time, okay? 
Then you need a, a non-traditional source of high-risk capital. That's venture capital, okay? And the last thing you need to build a really powerful innovation ecosystem is a culture that accepts failure. Uh, for those of you who ski really difficult hills, I'm sure you never learned how to ski on a really, really steep slope without falling down a few times. Well, same thing in building companies. Uh, you're going to try something really hard, and it's not always going to work. And the culture can't punish entrepreneurs for failing. Uh, in the Silicon Valley, we have a very large recycling machine for talent. And you have to remember that probably 70% of all venture-backed companies don't work. So what do you do with all those people? Well, they just start something else, okay? They, they not, all of the companies don't work. Now, as you can imagine, once you get an infrastructure like this going, then it keeps kind of a closed loop of innovation going because you get exits, successful companies, this creates more uh, money for early stage investing and new deals and in new companies and this thing just kind of spirals up and it gets stronger and stronger. And that's what's been going on in the Valley. But again, it's been going on for now since, I want to say, at least 40 years. And uh, it's a long process to build this up, okay? Now, one of the key points on the bottom of this slide is remember where the uh, intellectual property is coming from in universities and in government labs, it's being created mostly by spending from the government. And the United States government spends an enormous amount of money in those places trying to create new technologies. And governments that do this can be very successful at helping create new companies. It's a real uh, important part of that process. I'm gonna skip a few slides here so we can get to something else. So there are really four important things to creating a strong VC in an infrastructure. It's a flow of ideas. And it starts out with research, moves to commercialization, goes to deployment, and then, really importantly, adoption. Because if there isn't wide-scale adoption of the product or the technology, the companies can't really get very big. And and that's essential for venture capital to get returns on these investments. So if you can't drive through all four stages of this, it's very hard to get a venture capitalist interested in looking at your deal. So here is a cartoon that shows what that looks like. Uh, on the left side, we have lab research, or just smart folks like some of you in here who are just getting together with a new idea and you're doing your own research. But at that point, you've got to decide, can we start a company around this? Can we commercialize these ideas in a reasonable way? And so this requires a combination of technologists and people who are savvy about business and high-risk, early-stage investors that will put seed money in and help those guys or, or, or women build that initial team. And, and here, uh, what we say the DNA of these teams is really important. If you have the right collection of individuals with the right set of strengths, uh, you can create something very powerful. Um, if you're you know, just putting together a few folks to start something, without really carefully selecting the capabilities of each one of your team members, uh, that doesn't usually work very well. It, it also uh, doesn't look very good to investors. So uh, certainly in the Valley, one of the biggest things we look for as investors is who's on the team. Who are these people? Do we believe that they can execute this idea? Uh, I would say, in, in an investment decision process, that's number one. Uh, without that, 
mm, you could have a really great idea, but if you've got a B team that doesn't look like it can execute, um, they'll just mess it up. And, and so you won't be able to attract the right set of investment. Once you've gotten it to that point, then you need VC money to scale a company so you can deploy and build uh, commercial level products that you can ship. That takes more money. Okay? But once you've got some customer, at least endorsement at the commercialization stage, you're in a much better place to start raising money from what we would call them professional investors. Okay? In, in this case, VC. If we get enough customers, then what you may see, um, if you've read Jeff Moore's book about crossing the chasm, we will start to get enough adoption that we get into what he calls the tornado, where now everybody wants to use your product. And then to scale that kind of company, VCs will certainly help, and even if they don't, at that point, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. We have an IT for, no. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we know anything about that? All right. At that point, we may be able to bring private equity into the picture. Okay? And we can spend a lot more time talking about this slide, uh, but I'm going to do that now. Okay. But in order to make a structure like this really work, there are a number of things you have to have. And in, in, in the Valley, for example, uh, remember what I said about failure, okay? So companies go bankrupt, companies fail, and, and entrepreneurs need to be able to go through that process and just start over, okay? And they can't be burdened with huge taxes and all kinds of things that make it difficult for them to start, grow, or close, or pivot their businesses. Um, remember this. Uh, you've heard this a million times before, probably. Early stage companies are trying to figure out what their business model is. They don't really know. They kind of have some ideas, and they're going to try out some things and see if they can figure it out, whereas a large established company knows very well what its business model is. And, and you, you've seen this written any, in any number of places. So in the early days, of this experimentation. It has to be easy to do it. And that brings you down into things like labor law, where you need to be have enough flexibility to be able to control your staff and, and not generate huge hiring liabilities uh, in the middle of some kind of pivot. Uh, I had to pivot a, a, one of my companies about 18 months ago, and we ended up kind of swapping out about half the staff because we moved in a different direction and we needed to restructure the team. Um, it was fairly straightforward to do it, but in certain places, certainly in Europe, it's very difficult to do that. And, and then this makes it less desirable for investors because they don't want those liabilities. And, and lastly, protection for intellectual property is really, really important. Most technology companies have some kind of intellectual property as a differentiator to what they're doing. Um, I mean, unless they're doing iPhone apps or something like that. But, uh, and that's another story. But if you're starting with some serious technology, you want to be able to protect it. Now, it's been observed by many of my investor friends, and this may not be entirely accurate, so you give me some latitude here. But we've observed certain things going on here. There appears to be, and maybe this is gone now, a gap between getting the Series A done with VCs and then getting more funding later. Uh, this is, by the way, not an uncommon problem in a lot of places. Uh, Canada has this problem in a very serious way. Uh, it's relatively straightforward to get an A round done in Canada, but then most of the companies, as they scale up, they move to the United States because they can't get B round funding in Canada. Uh, and uh, we also need to have, as part of the educational process with the university, in conjunction with that, uh, you know, and with industry groups, uh, more training 
So entrepreneurial teams are really pumped up around what is the VC process, what do they want to see, how do we give it to them, and make it look really good. Uh, another characteristic that you see in sort of immature VC markets is term sheets from the investors that look more like something that came from an investment banker. Okay? They don't establish a win-win relationship with the entrepreneur. What you want is an investor who's your partner, not your antagonist, okay? And, and uh, early stage investing is very high risk and trying to protect yourself totally in that situation doesn't really make much sense. Um, on our website at Stanford, we have some interesting VC negotiations, if you want to look at that, where we start off with an incredibly onerous term sheet, and we walk through what the consequences of that kind of thing are. And you see, at the end of that process, why both parties are actually losing. It, it's just no good for anybody. Um, in the Valley, we have a very powerful way of pricing stock options in reasonable ways so we can attract high-end talent uh, to new companies and price those options uh, you know, significantly below what the price the professional investors pay in order to attract that talent. Very important to be able to do that. Okay? Um, in that silo chart we showed a minute ago, moving from left to right, in order to do that, we have to convince our investors that we have a large market. Because otherwise, they can't get the returns they need. This almost always, unless you're in the United States, it almost always means that you have to go global. And, and you have to do it sooner rather than later. And, and if you limit yourself to just a regional market, uh, then that becomes less attractive to be seen. Okay, and uh, the last point on this slide is interesting. Uh, in, in order to build companies really well, execution is very important, and that comes back to the team DNA. Who's on it, and do you have the right people? And frequently, not always, the entrepreneurs that start the company, and they'll be one, one of those people will be the CEO. Um, it's rare to see a CEO of a startup company succeed all the way through, let's say, the VRAM. At some point, uh, you, need to, you need to bring in a different level of management talent. Every once in a while, you get somebody who can go all the way. But that's, that's rare. That's not normal. Okay? Um, a few other points to be, to be made here. Um, too much bureaucracy is what this slide is really about, and, you know, complicated taxes and convoluted regulatory systems don't, don't make an attractive package, generally, for investors. They like things simple and clean and easy, and, and any improvements that we can make there really will go a long way to building up the strength. So, to wrap up. Uh, I think Brazil is a powerful opportunity for VC growth. Uh, we do expect more VCs to come into Brazil uh, from the United States. Um, multinational firms, I think, are going to increase the M&A activity here as, as long as we create uh, companies that have an international focus and a big market, okay? That's not just focus too narrow, okay? And uh, again, regulatory friction is an issue that I think needs to get addressed. Uh, and we need to support the entrepreneurs here more uh, in the educational area, in the transfer of IP area, and those sorts of programs. So um, with that, I will stop. <laughs> Thank you.